All right. Good afternoon, everyone, for our March session of the Society of Agricultural Communication and Scholars. I'm Ricky Talk of the University of Florida. And this afternoon, we have with us Amanda Ruth McSwain uh, from the uh, College of Charleston, who will be talking about establishing and leveraging industry connections in the classroom and beyond. Before she starts her presentation, uh, just a word to everyone here on the call. Uh, that uh, it's really up to the presenter how she likes to take questions, whether it's during the pro the presentation or at the end. Uh, and then after our discussion on this topic, we'll have a time, uh, hopefully a little bit later on, to talk about anything new, upcoming, uh, job openings, new programs, whatever is the discussion topic of the day. Uh, and uh, then we'll be finished for this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda uh, for this presentation this afternoon. Thanks, Ricky. And um, to answer that question, I would love to take comments and questions throughout the presentation. Um, I'm going to try to cover quite a few initiatives that I think uh, deserve kind of attention in the moment if you have questions. So please feel free to, to jump in and interject throughout. But for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am Amanda Ruth McSwain and I am an associate professor at the College of Charleston. Um, so I know that sounds kind of probably a little foreign to who is usually on the call, but uh, for the familiar faces, you know that my training is from the University of Florida. And um, one of the things that I quickly learned when I kind of moved into mainstream communication uh, with the College of Charleston Department of Communication was that the training that I had in AGCOM and at UF was uh, so truly superior, especially when it came to establishing industry connections and collaborations and partnerships. And it was kind of an eye-opening moment for me a couple years into kind of early professorhood when I realized that not everyone did this. It was just kind of something that I assumed, of course, we work with industry. Of course, we bring them into the classroom. Of course, we have research collaborations. Um, and like I said, I quickly realized that it's not the case. So um, I'm actually one of the few that really prioritize industry partnerships uh, throughout kind of my faculty life. So um, that is what I'm here kind of to share today is, is some of the initiatives and programs that I've been part of over the last almost 20 years at the College of Charleston, but most of these being more recent. So um, today I'd like to talk a little bit about how we look at industry partnerships. I think uh, a lot of us can point back to kind of the common ways in which we collaborate with industry, which is typically through research initiatives, obviously through extension efforts um, for kind of ag comm faculty, um, but other ways in which definitely scholarship points to beneficial industry partnerships. How do we find those partnerships? Um, you know, that's probably one of the questions I get most from faculty colleagues and even industry colleagues of, of how do we recognize those opportunities? How do we find the right partner? Um, and, you know, how do we create those relationships? And then I want to talk about kind of initiatives that fall under three different umbrellas, classroom partnerships, professional development partnerships, and then a different side or a different view of research partnerships. Um, and then talk a little bit about lessons learned. I feel like I could write a book on lessons learned, um, but sharing with you some of, I think, the most prominent lessons that uh, have really shaped some of the relationships that I've made over the years. So, you know, if you look at the scholarship, uh, industry academic partnerships are defined a variety of ways, um, but I like these two definitions or at least perspectives of looking at those partnerships with, uh, you know, mutually beneficial exchange. And sometimes that takes work to figure out that mutual, you know, beneficial um, relationship where not only are we getting something on the academic side for our students or for ourselves, or for our academic home units, but also that there's clear uh, and tangible benefit for the industry partner as well. So I try to really prioritize that when I'm creating these spaces of collaboration, um, but then also to kind of look at how, what, what is the impact of that work, right? How are we stimulating or strengthening uh, the initiatives that we're working on? So, you know, everything I'll talk about today follows and in, falls into these kind of two areas of, of scholarship about industry academic partnerships. And the one is workforce development. I mean, clearly 
there is um, great value in in creating uh, partnerships that help prepare, you know, career ready graduates. And that is a lot of my focus, especially when it comes to both my own professional development, but then also the classroom partnerships, but then also furnishing innovative ideas and solutions. And I don't necessarily come to that in a traditional research um, perspective, but thinking of ways that um, I can help industry partners, again, with kind of solving real-time challenges in a little bit of kind of more non-traditional ways. So we'll talk about these two areas. And again, I would say the majority of, since I, I do spend some time in current scholarship in the area of industry academic partnership, but most of it comes down to research. So I think there's great opportunity in researching and publishing on how we establish these partnerships that uh, maybe exceed that research goal. So um, again, as I mentioned, I, I'm continuously advocating for this work, uh, not only in my home department, but beyond. Um, I'm often giving presentations across campus of what some of these initiatives or programs look like. And I feel like I'm an evangelist half the time of, you know, there's so much great value here. There's, you know, greater perspective and access to resources and facilities and ways to scale up your research and build reputation. Um, so the, I really truly believe the values uh, or the benefits are, are just significant. Um, but then the pushback is typically, well, I see a lot of risk in that, or I see a lot of extra time in that, or managing that just seems like too much. Um, and sometimes even again, that question of, I don't even know where to start, you know, what, what, do, what am I, how do I even initiate the conversation? Where do I find those opportunities? And so for me, it comes down to, again, I think my training, I think I was extremely lucky to learn from Ricky and what a lot of these partnerships can look like, uh, how to reach out and discuss where there is mutually beneficial alignment. Um, but, you know, also really, truly, I know it sounds simplistic, but developing an opportunity mindset where I feel like almost any conversation I'm having with an industry colleague um, or, you know, an organizational, uh, potential organizational partner, I'm just kind of listening for ways in which I can kind of help solve maybe their bandwidth issues or challenges where they don't have the expertise on, on, on staff to, you know, research uh, or kind of look into investigate a certain issue they're facing. Or um, again, maybe I, we work with a lot of nonprofits. And so maybe again, they don't necessarily have the uh, talent resources or intellectual capital resources. Um, and, and we can provide some opportunity there. So, and on my end, looking for ways in each of my classes and um, in research projects and in other kind of extracurricular activities, ways to bring them into the fold. So it's just honestly a mindset that I have where I think I've experienced enough value at this point in partnership that I now kind of actively try to figure out ways to, to create those spaces, right? But um, a lot of my success has come from continued work with alumni, just making sure I am, uh, that alumni network is for me something that I'm constantly cultivating, you know, checking in on them, but then also using alumni to kind of figure out uh, what they're facing in real time in the workplace. We have a really amazing advisory board uh, in our department. Um, we were a very young department when I first started, and so we didn't necessarily have the opportunity to pull alumni in that were seasoned and experienced. And so we just were fortunate enough to um, kind of ask the right people to be part of this advisory board, and it has grown. It's an extremely impressive, significant, uh, and lengthy list of really senior top executives in the field of, of communication um, across across the U.S., really, and actually abroad now. So they come to campus twice a year. I'm continuously having those conversations with them about, you know, what are you seeing in terms of, uh, you know, the your junior employees, how can we better prepare them? What can we do together to make sure they're career ready? Um, how can we partner with you to solve an existing challenge? So uh, where I'm always talking to those advisory board members on ways that I might be able to kind of create partnership, right? But some other things that I do as well, I think, obviously, thankful, I'm so thankful for LinkedIn. You'll see that I'm I use LinkedIn quite a bit to put calls out for partnership 
uh, whether that's partners in the classroom or partners uh, in other uh, programs, uh, you'll see kind of, uh, I, I tend to use LinkedIn and different social um, network platforms to kind of at least create visibility around the opportunity. Um, and then I take those conversations kind of offline once I have interest and, and we'll have individual one-on-one -on -one conversations just to talk more about what the particular partnership could look like and what are, again, the benefits of, of that partnership. Um, because not all interest works out well. Uh, I've learned that for sure. And then I also, I don't, I'm not as good at this anymore. I mentioned to Jason and Ricky when I first joined that I actually, interestingly enough, in a story for a different day, but I live in Montana now. <laughs> and so I am still at the College of Charleston, but I am Montana. So uh, I used to, when in Charleston for 18 years, um, I would, you know, when I could always try to attend a professional association, whether it was PRSA or whether it was AMA or um, just a luncheon to kind of create some conversations and some opportunities to talk about what some of our industry colleagues were facing and dealing with and, and trying to, to talk about obviously ways to partner. So lots of different routes that I've taken to finding industry partners. But I think at the end of the day, it, it boils down to having that mindset of, you know, where, where I can kind of plug in that really valuable um, asset of a relationship into the work that I do. So in terms of classroom partnerships, I'd love to talk about three um, and, uh, and then we'll kind of move into professional development partnerships. But uh, the first is a year long capstone experience that I teach called the Com Agency. Um, and I'll talk about how we bring uh, industry partners into that year long experience. Um, I also a few years ago developed a sponsored case competition. It wasn't actually my intent. But in talking to a potential industry partner, someone who was interested in working with the class, uh, it was really their idea to come up with more of a, a competition approach to the work we were doing with them. And then classroom advisors. So um, the first I'd love to talk about again is the Com Agency. A few years ago, we revised our curriculum. And in talking about the curriculum, realized that some of the work we wanted to do at the capstone level was really not possible within the parameters of that one semester. And, um, you know, we, not all of us, in fact, I'm the only one who approaches the capstone the way I do, but we all, whether it was kind of a large publishable research project by the time our undergrads were finished with their program or uh, a significant work portfolio, we just felt like that one semester capstone was not giving us the time and opportunity for significant development with our students. So we moved to a two semester sequence and it's obviously a total of six hours for our capstone. The cool thing is it's it's variable topics. So we, at any given, we have over 700 majors. So at any given um, point, we have about eight to nine different sections of the capstone running, and they're all different topics. So you may have a professor who's teaching audio investigations and, and kind of the final outcome is uh, a series of podcasts or uh, you know creating a podcast platform um, with a series of podcasts, or you may have our leadership labyrinth capstone that focuses on leadership development. And it's a big research project, um, you know, with in qualitative work with with leaders. And so I again teach the Com Agency. So you can kind of see what we've what I've developed here is a student run agency, which is not necessarily. Uh, unique. I mean, there's a lot of universities that have a student-run agency, um, but typically that student-run agency happens kind of as extracurricular or kind of independent study enrollment, where this is, again, is, is kind of chewing off of a large portion of the, um, you know, the, the senior requirements in our major. And so what I have done for the past few years is create an opportunity for partners. I call them client partners. And I, I use that word partnership because it is not just a client relationship. Um, I really look to and establish the expectation that they are a very active part of the learning process. And um, it's not just us kind of creating work for them that meets their communication needs, but that they're a very large part of the conversation of teaching students about um, you know, not only how do we engage with clients, but also how do we create the strategy and the tactics and evaluate our work in ways that's meaningful to the clients. 
So um, you'll see this is actually just for this year's call, but on LinkedIn, I put out a call and what's fun is to kind of see the response to that call. Usually a lot of people will copy others and say, Hey, I think you guys might need this or, um, and attached to that call is an application. And um, I'll share that in just a moment. But, you know, any given year, we have anywhere from 15, usually 15 to 20 applications. And I look through those applications and I'm, and every year I kind of refine that application, uh, recognizing what's really important in that partnership and um, really trying to kind of articulate what that partnership looks like to the client before they actually, you know, definitely take the step into pursuing it with us. And so um, I'll review those applications, schedule one-on-ones. This is the first year I've done this from, again, a lesson learned, but schedule one-on-one -on -one conversations with those applications, just so I am not kind of losing any of the, the real kind of nuanced work of the partnership that's hard to, to communicate in just a document and make sure they understand what they're signing up for. Uh, Cause it's a pretty large commitment to be uh, a, a client partner for, for my capstone. But so we talk about, you know, their needs and what they're looking for and why they're experiencing some of these uh, needs or challenges in their workplace. And then I kind of talk about what it looks like from a student agency side, you know, what are the students equipped to do? Um, what are a lot of the outcomes that they may experience along with the students? And um, from there, they kind of, I, I keep all this information uh, handy that, you know, from their application, from my conversation with them. And then actually as a student agency, we select the client roster. This year, we're working with seven clients uh, from the 16 applications, and the students were a really big part of that selection process. I share with them all the data that I have from the client applications and talk about the conversations I had with them. And then, you know, again, as an agency, we, we determine that list of clients. So, you know, it, it, it follows a, a very typical kind of campaigns-esque approach to a lot of uh, what AgCom curriculum also includes. Um, and, uh, you know, but the great thing about this six hours is we have a really significant kind of formative research process and, you know, briefing period, which is great. Students are just learning how to kind of manage the client relationship in that first semester. Uh, there's a lot of handholding in that. There's a lot of kind of on-site work just to get to know the client and meet the team and really feel immersed and embedded with the client. Um, and then, you know, really kind of towards the end of that first semester is when we start truly creating a strong pitch for the work that will execute starting in January. Um, and the awesome thing, again, about two semesters is they actually get to see that and, and evaluate that work. So they have a full, um, you know, portfolio of work from you know, research to the pitch through execution to obviously assessment and evaluation. And so, and again, the client is extremely involved in all pieces of that, that process. Couple of things about the partnership in this context of, of the comm agency. Um, I have learned along the way, probably the most important piece is the partnership agreement. Um, it's a little lengthy, probably great. I'm sure most of my industry partners would appreciate a much uh, more brief document, but uh, it's about four pages that talks about what is our role as the student agency, what they can expect from us. Um, obviously, it starts out with the goals and the purpose of the partnership and why it's a really important partnership for both us and hopefully for obviously the client partner. But then also what we expect from, you know, the partner in terms of their commitment, in terms of accessibility to their organization, um, you know, and their their own kind of, you know, uh, organizational documents and assets. Um, and then it kind of also outlines very specifically what are some milestones along the partnership um, that, you know, they can expect in terms of deliverables, right? Um, and, and where do I also expect them to be uh, extremely participative? So I'll give them specific kind of periods of time where outside of client meetings, but where I really would like them to be, um, you know, part of kind of the teaching and learning experience versus just the client experience. I've also learned to ask the client, it kind of be odd for an NDA on our end, we're not necessarily providing anything confidential, but I do ask and really encourage all of our partners to have some type of NDA 
for our students to sign. And I think that they feel a little bit, once I ask for that, it's always awkward. Kind of this, this these initial discussions are always super awkward. Um, but, you know, I think once that I ask for that, then they feel a lot, um, kind of a, a lot more sure of entering the partnership in terms of the information that they share with us and how much accessibility we'll have to the organization um, and really what their role is. So we almost, almost all for of our seven clients, all but one actually of our seven clients uh, this year have an NDA with their, you know, their student team. And I think that's really important to, to just create a, a layer of you know, certainly um, kind of accountability on our end, right? And, but also uh, a feeling of less risk on the on the end of the partner. Um, so really at the end of the day with this comm agency, I think the partnership, you know, it's clear what the value is in terms of the, the students having, you know, a extremely realistic, uh, you know, impact or, or experience and impact on an organization where their portfolio of work hopefully speaks to, um, obviously the skills and knowledge gained, but also their ability to kind of really hit the ground running when it comes to agency life and even kind of organizational life when they're, when they graduate. Any questions about this particular partnership? No. All right. So similarly, I, I have a different class where um, the students weren't quite ready. I mean, it's, they're, they're not necessarily interested in, in agency work. Um, and it was a course, uh, also a capstone course, but I don't know if you're familiar with the life design framework, but we walked through the life design framework and really kind of helping students who were a little less sure of what they wanted to do post-graduation, uh, identify opportunities and, and see what they could do, put some of their skills and their knowledge to the test. So if you will, it's kind of a, a class of misfit toys. <laughs> Uh, where they're they're just they self-identify as those who just aren't quite sure they're ready, they're not feeling very confident, and they're just not sure what they want to do. Um, but I, I realized kind of in the second half of my work with them that they were ready to take on a, a very real challenge. And I wanted them to have the interaction with a, a partner to kind of give them that sense of um, you know, applied learning, experiential learning, but then also of, you know, giving, showing them that they should be confident in, in their work. Cause it's, it's, a, they have had the ability obviously to, to work with a, a client. So I put a call out, had some really interesting, you'll see this call is a little bit different. This was basically just, Hey, are you working on something that may, you know, need a little help or something you need to, uh, you know, a challenge you need to solve. I also sent emails to, or a couple of texts and emails to advisory council members to see if they had anything that we could work on. And, um, in talking to some of the people that responded, uh, I actually felt really lucky to, to find a company didn't have really much connection to this company. Um, but through a referral, um, talk to Zen QMS and, and they were facing a, a real kind of cultural issue, uh, especially with the move from a very rigid in-person workplace to, uh, a pretty fluid, pretty hybrid, uh, if even kind of more on the end side of remote, um, workforce post COVID. So our work environment post COVID. And so they really wanted to figure out their communication networks across the organization to enhance those communication networks, figure what's going, figure out what's going on. And so in talking to the potential partner, um, he said, I, he's like, I really want this to just be, you know, like a true challenge where there's something not just the experience for these students, but something that they'll get that kind of dangle the carrot in front of them. And so all of my, my across the entire class, we had teams work on the same case and um, they worked an entire semester on kind of their case response and then present it to the board and obviously the leadership team of Zen QMS. And um, what was cool is if they wanted it, the winning team had the opportunity to continue with Zen QMS throughout the summer as kind of a student consultant slash internship. And that was kind of the 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 reward, I suppose, or award, I guess, for uh, job well done. So there was a little bit of uh, a pot of uh, gold at the end of the of the work for the winning team if they wanted to pursue that that you know opportunity. Um, but this was a really great experience. I hope to. I'm not actually teaching this the same course uh, in the near future, but I hope to kind of replicate it. 
uh, again, at the senior level of work where students um, kind of feel a, a little bit of a competition space in terms of, of outperforming their peers um, and having a very clear, tangible benefit at the end of that experience. And the final piece that I partner with uh, is more at the 200 level of our curriculum. And I realized that I kind of about six years ago realized that my I teach a very large 200 level introduction to strategic communication course. And, um, you know, these students are not ready to engage with industry partners Uh one-on-one, -on -one, obviously just not quite professionally mature or, or quite there yet, but I still wanted them to have that feeling that, you know, there was some kind of uh, connection for them to, to learn, I think, you know, uh, again, a wider perspective of what I can offer in the classroom, as well as some real-time applied solutions to their work. And so I asked uh, a handful of local industry colleagues, some of which I knew well, some of which I didn't know as well, but um, asked them to serve as classroom advisors. And so there was a very large project that I do at kind of the, the second kind of quarter of, of this class. And um, I asked for those advisors just for a two, a two interaction commitment. So pretty low level commitment um, for that part, for those partners, but that they were assigned really small teams and really used as kind of um, a sounding board, obviously, you know, a, a group of people to advise on project uh, ideas and, and give them real-time feedback. And so those advisors, I've done this now for, again, this about six years, but um, it works really well because it obviously serves multiple purposes. Students are have the opportunity to meet and work with those partners in a really defined setting where they're not, they're not responsible for a lot aside from asking good questions and sharing their work and getting that feedback. But they also have that then that network contact for them where kind of they're also most of them are freshmen and sophomores and, you know, they're kind of they're nervous about establishing some of those network connections and it kind of creates that ready made situation for them to talk with someone in the industry and hopefully uh, keep that relationship going well beyond the classroom. Um, but those classroom advisors, it's been a really neat ad. Um, I think there's a couple of colleagues across campus who've tried to emulate a similar model of, of, you know, a low stakes environment, but bringing partners in where they can help in the learning. They can obviously provide real time feedback. They can share some of their own experiences uh, throughout that feedback. And then, you know, there's, I hope um, my, my hope is, and I think from a lot of the anecdotal feedback is those relationships are also beneficial for those advisors, whether it's just satisfying to be part of the learning process or the relationships that end up happening, you know, post, post class. So those are the three ways most recently I brought partner kind of partnerships into the classroom. Um, one of the, the things that I've worked on more recently as a fellow of our Martin Center for Mentorship and Communication is our mentor protege program and then the faculty, faculty shadowing program. And so these are partnerships that honestly, whether it's student professional development uh, or my own faculty professional development, they kind of lend back to a really clear benefit for, um, you know, again, the, the faculty member. This, our, our mentor protege and our mentoring the moment programs aren't necessarily, again, something that are, especially the mentor protege programs. I think most undergraduate and even graduate programs have some type of formal mentoring opportunities. Um, our mentoring mentor protege program was originally born out of our advisory council. So we had a small handful of, of students that were selected, they would apply and they were selected to work with an advisory council member throughout the year. Um, and as in a mentoring relationship, we've a, we were able to expand that program now, bringing a lot of uh, more of our kind of more local industry partners into that program as mentors. And so it's not really just our council, but it's also alumni and and local industry um, colleagues that that mentor our students. And and we've also kind of made some changes along the way. We just focus on juniors now, and we prepare those juniors to enter that mentoring relationship um, their senior year. So it's it has a lot of really neat angles to that program. Um, and I'd love to share more with you if you are interested in a mentor protege program. I've done quite a bit of research. That's why I'm a fellow with the with the center um, on mentoring. 
And we've done a lot of changes that I think are for the better to our mentor protege program based on that research. One thing though that came from our research last year with alumni is this mentoring in the moment. And we have asked, um, it's almost like a speaker's bureau of industry in a way, but it's more like a mentor's bureau. So if you think about kind of gathering up this expertise, we feel like over the years, we just have this amazing directory or Rolodex of, of people who want to be involved with our programs or people that have been involved in the classroom or with some of our initiatives outside the classroom. And um, we kind of tapped into that network to create um professional mentors. So they're all over the spectrum. They're some of our local industry professionals or some of our advisory board members. They're some of our alumni, but they're serving as mentors in the moment. And so we talked to a lot of alumni. We talked to a lot of young professionals that said, I just don't necessarily need a mentor for a long period of time, but I experienced moments in early in my early career where I feel like it would be helpful to have somebody, you know, whether it's kind of negotiating a new job or how to handle a, a new colleague at work or, you know, where there's really just no one inside the organization I can ask. And so we created mentoring in the moment, which is kind of short term in the moment questions where we'll connect those, those um, individuals who need some mentoring with someone from our mentors bureau, basically um, to establish again, a short-term connection. Um, and so, you know, it's primarily right now rolled out to our alumni as an opportunity um, to obviously be the mentee, but we, again, we've kind of used a lot of our industry partnerships to create a pretty significant um, list of, of professionals that are serving as kind of mentors in the moment. And then from partnership perspective, we just started this. I'm one of the first faculty to go through it, which is exciting, but a faculty shadowing program. We had a donor who said, I really want to help prepare faculty ready graduate. I mean, not faculty, but student ready graduates um, and or career ready graduates who, you know, feel confident to step into primarily agency settings, communication agency settings. And um, we knew that with 700 majors, it would be hard to do that in a way that was widespread and, and impactful across the department. So we kept, you know, kind of throwing around ideas, how to do this, how to use their funding to, you know, create more internship opportunities or to create more experiential learning opportunities. And then we realized that if we were attacking this through kind of faculty development, that we would be able to reach a lot more students with that through an impact of those dollars. So we created the faculty shadowing program. Um, and so far it's a colleague uh, this year, it's, it's two faculty that were selected um, to have kind of these shadowing uh, awards. And the first uh, is my colleague, he teaches research methods and primarily focused on really wanting to update our research methods curriculum to be a little more uh, focused on industry research needs than just kind of traditional academic research. And so he is currently actually embedded with Ketchum. He started over spring break and uh, spent a week at Ketchum in DC. And they kind of, that's where he met the team that he was going to work with, their insights team, and talked a lot about their current projects. He interviewed junior faculty to figure out how their research methods experience in undergrad translated to their job and how it didn't. Um, and now he's following along with those teams through two kind of beginning to end projects virtually. So there was a period of onsite immersion that is now continuing virtually. I'm excited this summer, I'll be going to Vested in New York. And you'll see my, you know, the program goal is to gain insights and information that will help faculty better prepare job ready graduates. But then my faculty goals were a little more specific. I have this hybrid, you know, student agency and I'm constantly scratching my head on how to, you know, better, better manage, I guess, the, the hybrid model of work for the agency. So I want to learn that. Uh, and how agencies do it who are, uh, you know, have a heavy hybrid model. And then also just to kind of see from a client management perspective, what I might be missing in terms of contemporary tools and best practices following a project from kind of the planning to activation and evaluation phases. So I will be in New York uh, for two weeks in June, and then we'll also be kind of sporadically um, jumping in on client meetings virtually, as well as team meetings throughout the rest of the summer in a virtual capacity. 
So, you know, finding those partners is not easy. Access to those organizations in that way and the commitment um, that we're getting from those partners is pretty, uh, again, significant. But um, thankfully, we're able to find partners that um, really buy into, I guess, for lack of a better term, buy into the value of, of you know, what that what that shadowing opportunity will mean for our students, how I'll be able to kind of bring back exactly what those organizations need in their new, their new hires, right, in our graduates. So um, that's kind of a, a fun way that, you know, we're also finding partners for faculty development and, um, you know, obviously trickling down to student impact. All right, and the final way I wanna kind of talk a little bit about some of the partnerships the created across the industry is, is research, but not, I think, in the traditional sense of, you know, actually conducting research with uh, industry partners because they have obviously expertise that marries nicely with faculty expertise, or they have a very specific need or resources to offer in that research relationship, but more of kind of access opportunities. So over, uh, you know, I, I view research partnerships in three different ways. Obviously that collaboration that we typically see in, in co-authored work. Obviously there's plenty of, of partnership opportunities when it comes to funding. And I say partnership loosely in that regard. I think it's obviously more of, you know, uh, a relationship there where there's benefit for both parties, but it, it's primarily an exchange of obviously resources, but then access. And so over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to create partnerships where there is clearly that mutually beneficial angle to the research. Um, and they've come just from random conversations of, you know, hey, this is what we're dealing with. This is what we're working on. And, and then all of a sudden we get to a space and conversation where there's a really great partnership opportunity. So I look at kind of part these, these access partnerships as site, data, and network. Um, the first, I was actually doing research for an individual project and I was in uh, talking with someone about their mentoring experiences. And she had kind of just in passing mentioned that her company does these kind of required, silly uh, mentoring programs when, you know, you have to, it's like a six month opportunity at the, your first year and then a six month opportunity at your fifth year of work and, and, and beyond. And, you know, she was saying how she thinks they're just absolutely ridiculous and they don't work, but, you know, they have assessment data that points to the fact that they do work and long story short, we were able to kind of continue that conversation just from that that little piece of her interview uh, with the Brunswick group and talk about trying to immerse ourselves as researchers, right, to, to the sites of these conversations where these mentoring programs are happening um, for their junior faculty, I mean, for their junior associates. And so um, we are in the middle of gathering um, really kind of more observation at this point of how their mentoring program is working um, and being and why they were interested in working with us in a partnership capacity is because they felt like maybe some of the, the self-report data they were getting back from these, you know, mentoring relationships was positive because junior fact, junior associates felt like they had to kind of say good things about it. They didn't want to kind of be held against them if they were saying it was uh, a relationship that was worthless uh, from a mentoring perspective. So we're, we're right now um, both on site and obviously in a remote capacity working with them to, to really understand the value of their, their mentoring program, um, again, for their, their junior associates. Uh, the uh, ANA Educational Foundation, we I, I did a little brief webinar with them on mentoring, and they mentioned having years and years of information from their mentoring program. Uh, they were looking to revise it, but they had all of this data. They had they've never done anything with it. And I said, well, would you mind sharing some of that? And I can kind of look through it. And thankfully, uh, we've we've learned a lot from that data. And hopefully, you know, obviously going to be able to publish from some of that. Um, but, you know, they just had it sitting around, didn't really have plans. It's a nonprofit, so not a lot of bandwidth to do anything with that data. Um, and now we kind of meet with them quarterly to kind of talk through some of the things that we're seeing that are that translate into kind of immediate ways to revise the program based on some of that data that we've been able to, to analyze. And then, you know, the network access, I, I mentioned our advisory council, um, but they are great. I do not hesitate for one second to ask them 
to, you know, connect me with somebody to expand their network, to um, obviously help with maybe a program or an initiative or project that I'm working on. So I feel like being able to tap into those networks and in a way almost view it as like snowball sampling uh, for, you know, depending on what we're working on, it has been uh, a great opportunity for, for partnership there. So most of those research doesn't actually come down to the collaboration in the actual research project, but more of kind of access for the research projects that we do. So I definitely mindful of time. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions and then certainly updates as Ricky mentioned, but a couple of the, the major lessons learned over truly almost 20 years of work um, in, in different kind of partnership capacities is, you know, that first one, just be nimble enough to seize the opportunity. And, and that I think means that for me, I am always willing to kind of pivot, to make some revisions to change my approach to something if I can fold in an industry partner, right? And so if that opportunity is there, how can I, even if I have a conversation a couple of weeks before the semester starts and I'm, I'm talking with somebody and they mention, you know, being able or needing something, right? Or, or, or facing a, a challenge in the workplace that nobody really knows how to solve. Um, you know, I'm, I will create the opportunity to, to work with them, you know, and to be able to seize that opportunity and, and make some changes even last minute to do that. Um, two, this is the big one, recognize the risk and articulate the reward. And this is for all parties involved. Um, I think, as I mentioned with like an NDA, like everyone has a little bit of concern, no matter what the partnership looks like, right? Is this going to be a waste of my time? What is the clear... Out, you know, outcome, what's the impact I can share with my larger organization or the impact on the student. Um, I think we all obviously realize that if we're going to commit time and energy to something, there has to be some kind of very clear benefit. And so, um, you know, typically there it's, it's helpful for me up front to, to tell partners, you know, I understand that, you know, there's probably risk here and there is risk. There's risk, especially from a student perspective, that the quality of work, you know, is, is something that, this you not know, meet your expectations. You know, hopefully that's not the case, but that can happen. Or, um, you know, the risk of obviously uh, opening up your organization to us and what that means. Um, but I think having both of those things at the outset of any partnership conversation is important, both written and kind of verbal conversation. I personally cannot stand <laughs> talking through these things one-on-one -on -one with potential partners, but I recognize it's something I have to make myself do um, because it really kind of allows for uh, a much more vulnerable place as the person kind of putting together the partnership, right? And and recognize and and being very open about what could happen and and some of the things that we've experienced in the past. But then also I think it puts uh, that partner at ease a little bit, right? To be very very um, understanding of, again, the risks as well as the rewards of the partnership. Um, clarity is key. And this goes with over-communicate too. I think so early, for so many years at the early parts of my career, I did not want to bother the client partner. I wanted it to be a partnership that we had a working relationship in place, but I, you know, I tried to really kind of communicate only when necessary. Um, and I realized that that was probably not the, the best approach. I think most of the time I assume a lot of things about the partnership um, and that, that maybe the partner doesn't necessarily assume. And so I have now a ton of different documents in place, different points that I have on my own calendar of like, today's a great day to reach out to this partner and check in and kind of share a progress update. Um, just lots of different ways to communicate timelines, to communicate progress, and um, obviously to make sure to check in on expectations and experiences. And so that goes with clarity is key. I think I, at this point, have just an arsenal of, of documents, right, of, of, you know, things that articulate and outline, you know, different parts of the partnership. Maybe it's overkill, but I really feel like my life has gotten easier now that a lot of those things are in place. And then, you know, one thing that I did not do well and at all, honestly, until the last couple of years, I was associate dean for a few years and realized the importance of assessment and evaluation and showing all of the fruits of the labor. And so now almost all, still not all, but most of the initiatives I shared with you and a few more that I didn't share we have some kind of formal assessment mechanism in place where 
you know, it's obviously helpful for program revisions and insight to help us understand the true benefits of the partnership on both, you know, for both parties. But also, you know, I think sometimes, I don't know, I don't want to speak for where you are, but sometimes, um, you know, doing this kind of work requires a little extra explanation to administration and, um, you know, why we would spend um, you know, quite a bit of time or resources and in, in some of these initiatives to be able to have those obviously clear um, metrics and, and clear results to share. And again, I did not do this very well um, for many years. And so now there's different layers of assessment, whether that's student and client performance assessment, whether that's just partnership outcomes uh, and experiences, but differently, def definitely different types of assessment are built into to each of the partnerships, no matter what they are. So with that, I would love to kind of take any questions or even I would even more so love to learn from you and hear uh, about the different ways that you might work with industry partners um, across your faculty life. But just take a couple of minutes for some discussion and then, um, you know, turn it back over to Ricky for updates. Sure, sure. Uh, so we have a question in the chat. I'll go ahead and read that to you, Amanda, but others of you who have questions, feel free to either put it in the chat or unmute your microphone. Uh, so Dixon had the question, have you had cases where industry mentors feel they should be compensated for their time? How do you handle that when you do not have allocations, I assume, for funding for such payments and not seem exploitative? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. And I, I appreciate that question because I won't say it necessarily um, comes up a lot, but I think especially when um, maybe the, the partner benefit is not as clear as the academic side of the, you know, of the benefit. Um, and so there are a couple, especially like those classroom advisors, sometimes even the, the mentor programs, um, you know, I think we can, we can clearly outline and share benefit of those, you know, for those roles that indus our industry colleagues may take. But, um, but I do think that sometimes it's, it's kind of more of an intrinsic, uh, value than, than extrinsic reward in those circumstances. And so it's a great question. I, I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to not necessarily, um, have to face answering that question. Um, most of the industry partners, I think it's because the way I approach those conversations and outline the partnership experience that I don't necessarily leave that open for vague interpretation. <laughs> um, and so I'm pretty specific on what, you know, the, the value is and the benefit and, um, you know, and obviously make it very clear the commitment on both sides. So there's no hopefully kind of ex feeling of ex exploitation of obviously time or talent or resources. Um, and, you know, I do think that there could be a situation, I, I don't necessarily think in the programs that I've helped develop and carry out, but I think there could be a situation where there is some kind of stipend, uh, you know, for an industry partner, if the value is clearly one-sided. Um, but thankfully, I haven't necessarily run into that, that, that specific issue. Tracy, you have a question? So Amanda, the biggest problem we've always had in working with clients is that we don't meet their expectations, mm -hmm. that we have a student, I mean, they're students, they're still learning, right. they're, gonna, they're not always going to be the professional level sometimes. How do you manage some of those expectations, both for the student when they don't meet the expectations, um, and or the client in that we push them hard enough to get them out of their, the student out of their comfort zone, but at the same time, it's not the same as if you paid yeah a consulting agency to do the work. Right, right. And so I've run into that, I mean, a ton, Tracy. So it's uh, that has been, and I think that's one of the things that I've also gotten better at communicating upfront. Um, and I can share that partnership agreement, but that's one thing in terms of variability of work performance that I highlight going into those one-on-one -on -one conversations with partners of saying, you know, this is, I get to actually draft my, long story short, but I get to draft my capstone. So I kind of know coming in the types of students I'm working with, their skill level, their experiences, they apply to be part of it. Um, and so I can share with the client, like this is, this is what I'm kind of uh, imagining, you know, what will be able to de deliver the level of quality, the level of work. Um, but there will be times where we may not kind of meet that expectation, right? Depending on the students uh, and my even ability to kind of work with the students to, to get there. So 
Um, I, you know, I, I haven't had anything extreme except for one time where the client was pretty upset given the significant level of commitment um, that they, they only were able to use some of the student work. Um, and that is a, a moment where I learned to insert quite a few um, checkpoints throughout the relationship and giving those clients twice, actually, throughout each semester, I give them the opportunity to pull out of the partnership if they're finding it to be too taxing on their time and resources, but also not necessarily what they expected from a, a work uh, kind of output um, side of things. And so that those also were initially kind of awkward conversations, but now I'm also upfront that there'll be twice this semester and twice next semester that I will check in with you. I'm going to schedule a quick meeting to see how things are going, see if there's things that we can address early on to, to change, whether that is again, kind of their communication and correspondence with clients, the way they're managing that relationship or their quality of work. I've, I've had to move some student teams around where I may have a, a team working for a client and it actually ends up being really strong students. And I might have to pull one or two of those and move them over to a different client to kind of help with quality of work. But um, yeah, I mean, that that's always a painful part of this process. Um, but I think, again, kind of those checkpoints that I communicate up front are helpful. And then um, also, you know, to, to make sure that the client partner understands that at the end of the day, this is a learning experience. Um, and hopefully the work they can use and is very valuable, but there may be things that either they have to continue to work on after we hand it over or, you know, have someone on their team kind of help shepherd um, to get it to the point of, of, you know, distribution ready. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. Other questions for Amanda? Other comments or other ideas of how you've been able to incorporate these type of partnerships at your universities? Amanda, your second question there about what have you learned? So one of my faculty had a, a class a year ago fall where each group in the class had a different client and they were working on, I think, building out basic, uh, a basic identity plan um, or an identity package, you know, logo and right. identity materials like business card and that kind of stuff. And what she found was that the client management work got in the way of the student learning. So it was a foundational course focused on some of the foundational design ideas and, you know, better skills in InDesign and better skills in Illustrator and the idea of, you know, some of the visual theory application and some of that and, and types of things. And the issues with the client management of getting that experiential learning piece got in the way of their ability to learn the foundations of the course. Um, and so this is more of a comment than a question. So what she's done in this past fall was retool the class so there was only one client and it was one client that she was familiar with. And then the students then got to refocus on all of the inputs can either come through the instructors. So that way they can get feedback or whatnot directly from the instructor when clients not available um, and working on that. So it maybe it, it is a question. So what point, where do you gauge the value of the experiential piece versus the value of, you know, getting the real world, the client aspect, versus the the learning of what the activity is really supposed to be to help better prepare them for when they go out and trying to take that the client piece out and focus on the, you know, when there's value in the client management skills, but it's also in the in the activity itself, right? Yeah. What they're actually supposed to be producing. I think that's such a good point, Jason. And one thing that I I have I, I also probably a large lesson learned is um, I think I mentioned I used to teach a campaigns class one semester at the senior level and um, had gotten to the point where I said, I even though I love the model, I would no longer teach it because I just, it was too much, right? It was too much to teach the students how to, you know, really develop a campaign, even though we had courses leading up to that, that certainly contributed to that work. Um, you know, it was just too much to try to accomplish in one semester and hand over, obviously we didn't execute on that campaign, but we did hand over a large campaign plan, you know, that the, the client could take and, and activate or execute on their own. But I kind of, I got to the point for that same reason. I'm like, I'm trying to kind of serve two masters here. It's too much going on. Um, students aren't really learning enough of either. And so, uh, thankfully just a couple of years later is when we moved to that two semester model, clearly a lot of curriculums cannot, you know, afford or, or, or make that move to a two semester, six hour course. 
Um, but that's where I think, you know, I have two major questions that guide that decision is at what level is this appropriate for the students? You know, if they're learning something new, I will almost never have them work directly with some kind of client partner, right? I may, I may ask, you know, a partner, or I may ask even just an industry colleague, like, Hey, shoot over a situation you're working on. I'll type it up into a case and, and give it to the students. And, you know, there's really no kind of commitment there or obligation to the partner. Um, it's just, it helps me get real time information to share with the students. Right. So, you know, it's really kind of the level of, of where the student is. Um, and I really view it my capstone. I'm really just reviewing a lot of things with them and helping to kind of fine tune and polish. And I do have, now that I have two semesters with them, I do have time to really work on, um, you know, how do we work in an organizational agency setting? How do we manage clients? And really kind of covering a lot of that before we actually get into the actual communication, right, skills and concepts and practices. So um, it was also, yeah, it was a very steep learning curve for me when it came to where was the right place to do this work in the curriculum, number one, and how much time do I need to actually build in an experiential learning component where the students are working, you know, in relationship directly with the client. But that's a great, I mean, I learned, I learned that same exact thing that your colleague did. Hmm. Great. Well, with that, I think I'm going to have to Getting, we're getting close to time, unfortunately, but uh, you provided a lot of information that I'm having to unpack too and wish that I would have had a lot of this <laughs> earlier on in my career. It's like, oh, uh, that would have helped a whole lot. And so some of you who are brand new to the to the profession, maybe you can take some of what Amanda has shared here and there's your contact information. So I think I'll speak for you, Amanda. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to her afterward. Uh, because I do think this is going to be a topic that we're all going to be focused on in the in the near future and beyond as well. So yeah, yeah. I'm happy to share materials and anything else that may help kind of create framework for you know for work with industry partners. So thanks so much for having me. What what fun to see familiar faces. Great. Well, thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, we have one more uh, Society of Agriculture Communication Scholars webinar meeting. It'll be. A little different. It'll be on the third Monday of April as opposed to our regular fourth Monday so that it does not conflict with an upcoming national conference that many of us will be attending. Uh, so we'll have Jeff Miller and Taylor Ruth who will be focused on the topic of science communication in agriculture. And I'll be sending out a little bit more information about some specifics regarding that. But it will be April 15. April 15, not April 22nd, which would have been the fourth Monday of April. So again, feel free to reach out to Amanda. Hope to see everyone again uh, next month. That will be the last one for the 2023-2024 academic year. And be thinking already about if you would like to do a topic for the next academic year, I'll be sending out a poll for ideas for the next year as well. So thank you all very much for joining us. Have a great afternoon.